My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and never has a single fictional universe swallowed me whole like The Elder Scrolls has. No, this isn't some weird vor fantasy. I mean engrossed, enveloped, consumed, and utterly submerged by a sprawling fantastical universe. As a child, I was always drawn to the imagination, creating worlds and stories with action figures and teddy bears, trying to replicate the imaginative grandeur of fiction like The Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, or Disney. By age eight, I had discovered the world of gaming beyond Pokemon Ruby and Fire Red, PC games like Warcraft 3 and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. They stirred my imagination beyond so that when I wasn't stuck to a screen, I was outside playing with plastic lightsabers or climbing trees with friends, elves versus orcs, that kind of thing. Fast forward to 2006 and I've just received money from my nan for my 11th birthday. I'm at a super center, a big furniture appliance complex. My parents are shopping for some tables or something. I don't know, it was a long time ago and hardly the focus of the story, but regardless, I'm there and in this super center was a Harvey Norman. It's a retailer here in Australia. They have a tech gaming section, so I was looking around there and then I saw it. The Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. I had zero idea about the Elder Scrolls, but I read the back of the box, Live another life in another world. Create and play any character you can imagine, from the noble warrior to the sinister assassin. I was hooked immediately. I said goodbye to my birthday money and hello to my brand new addiction. However, what was considered a disaster by the 11 year old me is the fact that I had to hang around for a few more hours as my parents were looking at new furniture. Though this little moment of delayed gratification gave me something special. I was so excited to play this brand new game so I remember just sitting at a wooden table in the furniture store and reading the game manual. Even writing this right now, I'm getting nostalgic about old video games manuals. They weren't just little sheets of glossy paper with the controls diagram, they were full-blown explanations of the game's mechanics and world. As I read that Oblivion guide, I was getting so damn excited. It told you all about the skills, all the races, how you could buy horses and houses. I was already hooked and I hadn't even started playing the game yet. I was going to play an orc, this image in particular convinced me. I just can't explain the ridiculous excitement I had while reading this manual. I feel like only a child can truly be that excited. We get home and finally I make my orc character and spend the next hour or so getting out of the Imperial sewers. Australia is a really, really sunny place, right? And you remember those old early 2000s TVs with the curvature? Well, yeah, the glare was insane and the sewers were so dark. Took me a while, but finally here I am, looking out at an ailed ruin, ready to run out into the world, and now I have to take the dog for a walk. That whole walk, I must have been thinking about Oblivion the entire time. Finally, I'm back from the walk, I run upstairs and I'm back to Oblivion. My orc character is named Thrall, by the way. Not exactly lore-friendly, but Thrall was the orc name I knew from Warcraft, so... You know, kid logic. I did not know how to fast travel, so I end up running out into the wilds. I try to shoot a deer for five minutes. It becomes nighttime, it's pouring rain, and I just fight the darkness and screen glare until somehow I ended up in Breville. I fought a guard, ran away. Now I'm a criminal on the run. Guards were really powerful and I desperately wanted their armor for whatever reason. I remember fighting a guard in an Aelid ruin for a good 20 minutes just to get their fresh outfit. Over time and throughout my many experiences of other characters, Oblivion became my favorite game of all time. I remember bringing the instruction booklet to school to show Michael and insisted that he get it because it's the most epic game I've ever played. Funnily enough, some time later, I was actually at the same Harvey Norman and found a PC copy of Morrowind in the bargain bin and gave it a whirl. I absolutely fell in love with the alien feel, the netches, the buildings, the bone mold armor, but admittedly, I would not get too far outside of exploration until later in life because coming from Oblivion, the idea that you strike and don't hit did not gel well with me. True appreciation for Morrowind comes when I am older, but that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of how Elder Scrolls hooked me at 11 years old, the first steps that would lead me to this point, where I'm writing a script for a video that I'm going to upload to a primarily Elder Scrolls YouTube channel that functions as a full-time job for me. So if you're wondering, I think it's fair to say that this video may be a little bit biased. I love the Elder Scrolls through and through, but at the same time, it's definitely not perfect and at times it's rather derivative of typical fantasy tropes. However, at the same time, it often subverts those same tropes in unique ways, discusses deep philosophical meanings, and provides unique examples 
examples of world building unmatched by others, all while still making a really fun game. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself because I'm going to take a good while to explain why The Elder Scrolls is the greatest fictional universe to me. The world of Nern is this exquisite mix of both typical fantasy derivatives and alien uniqueness that culminates in something beautifully original, but something that also features the familiar fantasy touchstones that audiences have enjoyed since the days of D&D and Tolkien before that. We have a world of elves, men, orcs, and dwarves, dragons, goblins, and demon lords. It's almost weird to think about it in that fashion. When you put it plainly and without all the detail, The Elder Scrolls is your run-of-the-mill fantasy world. And to be honest, as the series that had its roots as a D&D setting that Bethesda staff played, it makes sense. The Elder Scrolls 1 Arena and The Elder Scrolls 2 Daggerfall, while enjoyable and impressive in many respects, were far closer to what would be considered typical or traditional fantasy. And let me be clear, I am in no way bashing the typical fantasy tropes. Tropes become mainstream for a reason, and that's because they're usually good. But of course they can get tired after time. The game changer for the Elder Scrolls series comes, funnily enough, with a spin-off, The Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard. During this game's development, the world building for The Elder Scrolls III Morrowind was being established by a team of writers at Bethesda, including the likes of Todd Howard, Michael Kirkbride, Ken Ralston, and Kurt Kuhlman. With The Elder Scrolls Adventures Redguard came a copy of the first pocket guide to the Empire, a small booklet which denoted the world of Tamriel through the eyes of an Imperial. This would be a fundamental building block for The Elder Scrolls world we know and love. It is in this pocket guide to the Empire that the foundation for some truly awesome lore was set. The booklet is laden with beautiful descriptions of cultures that just stir the imagination, beckoning promise of amazing lands that we may one day see. In the section about Skyrim, we hear about Isgrimor's return and the Night of Tears, Vraga the Gifted's Empire of Nords, and the infamous Tongues. Here's a little excerpt. Masters of the Voice are known as Tongues, and their power is legendary. They can call to specific people over hundreds of miles, and can move by casting a shout, appearing where it lands. The most powerful Tongues cannot speak without causing destruction. They must go gagged, and communicate through a sign language, and through scribing runes. In the days of the conquest of Morrowind and the founding of the First Empire, the great Nord war chiefs, Derek the Tall, Jorg Helmbolg, Hoag Merkula, were all tongues. When they attacked a city, they needed no siege engines. The tongues would form up in a wedge in front of the gatehouse and draw in breath. When the leader let it out in a thumb, the doors were blown in and the axemen rushed into the city. Such were the men that forged the First Empire. The Thum is a rather creative and interesting way to look at magic. Old ideas of language as magic and words having power is taken literally and made into an interesting magic system. And I think this kind of power furthers their world building by making it so that siege engines are not needed and they can still somehow be an empire of barbarian archetypes. It's smart use of magic to allow them to retain a distinct identity Entity without having to compromise it for practicality. Same goes for the ideas that they're immune to cold, hence the bare-chested hunks roaming the snows, and the idea that they paint themselves in magical woad to act as physical protection. Admittedly, some of this charm did not make it into the more contemporary games, but still it's worth mentioning. Now, some of the world building is done to justify the existence of fantasy archetypes, such as a nation of Conan-esque barbarians, which in itself is interesting because rather than subversion, it's a doubling down or a hyperbole of fictional ideas about hardy northern men, but made into reality in this world. On the other hand, you have the subversion of typical fantasy tropes. For example, we have long heard of peaceful and romantic wood elves who live in harmony with the forest, engaging in feasts of fruit and copulation. Well, true, the Bosma are known to be a peaceful, romantic bunch of elves who live in harmony with the forest, but in the Elder Scrolls, there is a gritty reality. You see, the Bosma
Phasma as part of the Green Pact with their forest god must refuse to damage any of the flora. That includes for use in tool creation, clothing, or even road clearing. This creates a weird culture where you have strictly carnivorous elves who also practice ritual cannibalism as a form of extreme prevention of waste. And did I mention that they were also once crazy shape-shifting beasts that made the Green Pact with the god so that they can have stable forms? And at that, they may even unleash such power in times of need, called the Wild Hunt, where hordes of wood elves turn themselves into a ravenous collection of beasts, some tangible, some vaporous, a brutal force of nature that destroys its enemies and then cannibalizes itself in an orgy of destruction. But the Elder Scrolls lore is not simply a collection of hyperbole cultures and subversions either. It also introduces new races and their subsequent cultures, such as the Khajiit of Elsewhere, cat people whose forms are determined by the phases of the moons, ranging in size from mammoth-sized cats to house cats to humanoid cat peoples. They also ritually consume moon sugar said to be crystallized moonlight. That may only be a pop sentence about the Khajiit, but to the uninitiated, that already sounds strange and interesting. Now, if you know me well, you're just sitting there waiting for me to start running my mouth about the Dunma. Well, you're in luck because it begins now. It's time to talk about the game that laid the foundation for the modern Elder Scrolls, a game that pulled Bethesda Game Studios back from the brink of financial ruin and a game that would immortalize the series. We are talking about Morrowind. The Traveller, upon crossing Shadowgate Pass, may be forgiven for believing that he has left Tamriel and entered a different world. The sky is darkened regularly by furious ash storms belched forth from the mighty Vardenfell volcano. The familiar flora and fauna of Tamriel is exchanged for bizarre and twisted forms that can survive the regular ashfall. Cloaked and masked dark elves tend herds of giant insects. A courier clatters by on the back of a twenty-foot tall crab-like creature. Everywhere, cowering slaves, Argonian, Khajiit, human, scurry to carry out the barked commands of their dark elven masters. In former times, the clans carried out feuding with open warfare. This was forbidden under the tribunal, but the clans still engage in bloody infighting through the unique institution of the Morag Tong, the sanctioned guild of assassins. Clans routinely hire the Morag Tong to eliminate their enemies, and the assassins of the Morag Tong may kill their assigned marks with impunity, as long as they conform to the obscure but strict rules of their guild. Dark Elven warriors favor a wonderfully light armor made from the carapace of insects covered over with a finely woven cloak of spider silk wrapped several times around the torso. A turban protects the head and face from the ubiquitous ash, with goggles of transparent resin, loose trousers, and high boots completes the dress. While this makes for an outlandish appearance, the traveler will understand understand the utility of these garments the first time he is caught out of doors in one of the frequent ash storms without such protection. When indoors, dark elves shed these outer coverings and luxuriate in a variety of richly colored fabrics, sashes decorated with clan symbols are common, while cumbersome ceremonial costumes made from various parts of giant insects are the glory of those of the highest rank. The first pocket guide to the Empire has set the Dunma up for success, and in 2002, to the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind released, putting one of the most inventive examples of world building into the forefront of gaming. Morrowind is a land like no other. Unlike many other fictional fantasy cultures that can be related to via a singular large influence, for example, Nords and Scandinavians, or Imperials and Romans, including the Byzantines, the Dunma of Morrowind have no such single real world historical touchstone, instead borrowing from a vast range of sources, both fiction and historical, and blending them together in such a way that it produces an original, unique, and alien world that is both believable and fantastical. To me, this is the beauty of good world building. It can make you believe in and accept a world of legalized assassination, god kings, giant tick buses, egg miners, land jellyfish, mushroom tower wizards, and bone armor. Another credit to the uniqueness of Morrowind includes its cited inspirations such as Star Wars, Dune, and Dark Crystal. In fact, genre bending is really part of what gave Morrowind such a distinct feel. Walking into Aldrun for the first time feels akin to first setting foot on a new planet. 
Then consider the Dwemer, otherwise known as the Dwarves, an ancient lost race who even thousands of years ago had mastered magic and technology to the point that they have giant underground bases, observatories, and robots. I mean, they even tried constructing their own mech-like god. On the other hand though, the world still feels accessible to the player who is familiar with conventional fantasy tropes. There are a guild of mages, the Wood Elves and Orcs, Barbarians and Bandits, plenty of familiar touchstones that allow people to feel not entirely lost. It's that nice balance that teeters on the edge of so alien it's off-putting, but still familiar enough to be relatable. I think Morrowind specifically had such a unique flavor unrivaled by the rest of the entries in the franchise, and it was Morrowind that really laid the foundations for the modern Elder Scrolls games. I could toot Morrowind's horn all day in regards to its creative world building and awe-inspiring art designs, but I've done my fair share of that on the channel already, but the point is that Morrowind set down the fantastic ground work for something special and it brought Bethesda back from the brink of financial ruin which set them up for the sequel. Oblivion, the most cherished game of my childhood. It will always and forever have a special place in my heart. And to be honest, I think it was a great thing that I started off with this one, mainly because it was my introduction to the lore, so I had no previous expectations. From a lore perspective and a creative design perspective, Oblivion played it safe. You may know about the Cyrodiil is a jungle debacle, which is based on the idea that in the first pocket guide to the Empire, Cyrodiil is described as follows. It is the largest region of the continent and most is endless jungle. Its center, the grassland of the Nibine Valley, is enclosed by an equatorial rainforest and broken up by rivers. As one travels south along these rivers, the more subtropical it becomes until finally the land gives way to the swamps of Argonia and the placid waters of the Topol Bay. The elevation rises gradually to the west and sharply to the north. Between its western coast and its central valley, there are all manner of deciduous forest and mangroves, becoming sparser towards the ocean. The western coast is a wet dry area and from the Rehad border to Anvil to the northernmost Valenwood villages, forest fires are common in the summer. There are a few major roads to the west, river paths to the north, and even a canopy tunnel to the Velothi Mountains, but most of Cyrodiil is a river-based society Society surrounded by jungle. But what was delivered instead was a pretty typical looking European fantasy environment. Perhaps this was due to practical limitations, but ultimately the alien strangeness that was in Morrowind was replaced for what is admittedly a more generic fantasy world. Now, don't get me wrong, I love it. 11 year old me never knew about Jungle Cyrodiil, but I can imagine as a fan of Morrowind going into Oblivion, one could be a little disappointed. However, by virtue of it sharing the same lore content as Morrowind, the game contains a lot of spice still, especially when you dive into the lore regarding Pelennor Whitestrake and the Knights of the Nine, and Bethesda most definitely heard the desire for Morrowind-esque themes and weirdness because they answered the initial dissatisfaction with the Shivering Isles expansion, which delivered one of the most beloved, wacky, and zany experiences in the realm of the mad god Sheogorath. But as for Cyrodiil itself, typical fantasy is what it was for the most part. The Peter Jackson trilogy of the Lord of the Rings movies had been releasing through throughout the start of the decade, and their unrestrained success surely had immense influence on the design direction of Oblivion. But to 11 year old me, who already adored the Lord of the Rings movies, this was awesome. It's almost improved the experience for me in the ways they felt similar. Even today, I appreciate Oblivion on its own, despite the fact its overall tone departs significantly from both Skyrim and Morrowind. And to this day, I prefer the way the protagonist is handled most in Oblivion. You aren't the chosen one. You aren't born a dragon-slaying, soul-eating badass who can shout men into oblivion, or you aren't the prophesized reincarnation of an ancient hero who is set to kill gods and take names. You're a random prisoner who happened to be in the wrong cell. You're Sean Bean's little helper. You help the chosen one, Martin Septim. Of course, you play a big role, but you particularly aren't anything special, and to me, this just makes for the best clean slate role-playing opportunity. To its credit, Oblivion also introduced many, many new players to the Elder Scrolls and once again set us up for a sequel five years later.
2011 was the longest year of my life. When the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim was announced, I was beyond excited. I don't think ever in my life have I anticipated something with so much enthusiasm. I knew every trailer back to front. I was planning my character from the second we had an inkling of character building info. I think only Elder Scrolls 6 will be able to generate the same level of childlike blind excitement that I experienced with Skyrim. I was 15 when it rolled up to the release date, the 11th of November, but here in Australia, a bunch of retailers broke release date and Michael and I got our hands on it late after afternoon November 10th. That weekend Michael slept over and we both had Skyrim set up and just played non-stop for hours, sleep for a few hours, then just wake up and play again from sheer excitement. By the time we had founded this channel in 2013 we had played thousands of hours and this is not an exaggeration, it's quite frankly ridiculous. A borderline obsession. Since then, we have been making many character build videos, lore videos, discussion videos, all kinds of content on a franchise we are so passionate about. I loved and still do love Skyrim, obviously, but it was not until around 2013 where I really started digging deep into the lore and replaying Morrowind with fresher, older eyes really grasping everything. Through that new lens, you can begin to see some of the pitfalls or softening of the crazier elements of lore. Pre-Skyrim, there was no Dragon Wars, no Dragon Shouts, the Thorn was just a power used by ancient Nordic tongues given to them by Kine. Speaking of which, they had a badass Nordic pantheon in a bitter, craggy, frozen land of hardcore men and women. Whereas in Skyrim, we got medieval Scandinavia, which again, I reiterate, I really love it despite this. How could I not love a game despite thousands of hours willingly spent in it? But I would be remiss not to mention the fact that I really love Morrowind's examples of crazier, more creative lore, and the foundations for this kind of more interesting lore were set for all the provinces in the first pocket guide to the Empire. But this is some real lore beard nitpicking, and I would be devastated if some were to interpret this as hatred for the game. The reality is the opposite, and I would argue that it's only because of the immense love for the franchise that so many people are ready to critique and express their desire for an even better version first. Without stating the obvious, which is of course, it's a great game. It's the classic problem of raising the bar. Standards will just go up and up and up, and if you don't meet them, you'll be lambasted. I'm sure most of you guys are very, very familiar with Skyrim. Our channel is testament to our enjoyment of the game, and we could talk forever about it, but there are more games in the franchise to discuss and we need to stay on topic. The Elder Scrolls Online is the black sheep of the 21st century Elder Scrolls releases. I myself have been critical of it in the past and after multiple attempts of me trying to get into the game, I just can't. It's an MMO, it's just not really my thing and I just don't like the feel of the gameplay. It's just not the same as Skyrim or Oblivion. Others can get into it and that's fine, but here is the truth. I wish I loved The Elder Scrolls Online. While it started off rough, and I think the main story and premise for the Three Banners War and their alliances can be really, really weak lore, future content in the form of DLCs and expansions, such as Orsinium, Morrowind, Somerset Isles, and elsewhere, have done wonders for the lore. Do I love all The Elder Scrolls Online lore that has been added? Definitely not. But on the other hand, I think it really catches a bad rap. The Elsewhere expansion did the province incredible justice, and just like we discussed in our podcast, the mythology or theology they created for the Khajiit is my favorite, second only to the Dunma. But then again, there are things like the Somerset Isles DLC, which, same as Oblivion, pushed aside previous more alien depictions of the land for a more typical Lord of the Rings-esque elven country. But the Elder Scrolls Online, most of all, has continued to make Elder Scrolls relevant. For many people, it introduced them to the Elder Scrolls mainline series, or instead reignited their passion for the universe. I really think the Elder Scrolls Online has done the Elder Scrolls universe way more good than harm. It's not perfect, but I guess the real red pill is that nothing ever will be. If I look at Oblivion with older cynical eyes, I can see all its problems and pitfalls. But if I be that 11 year old again, I can enter my ideal fantasy world completely ignorant of what is supposed to be a jungle and what is quote, not alien enough. 
I think now we've said enough about all the modern Elder Scrolls games individually. You understand the foundations of the Elder Scrolls I love, as well as its deviations and additions throughout the years. We're about to get into some of the more in-depth explanations as to why I think this is the greatest fictional universe, but before I do, I just want to reiterate that I'm not saying the Elder Scrolls is the greatest RPG to ever exist. Many will debate the lack of meaningful choices determining outcomes, but really the realm where the Elder Scrolls really thrive is that of the sandbox. You can enter this brand new amazing fantasy world, awe inspiring and expansive, be whoever you want, do whatever you want to do, join the thieves guild, assassinate a guy you don't like, go hunt a deer, give charity to a beggar, or slay a big monster. You don't have to be Geralt the Witcher, you can be Ogrub the Orc Wizard, or Gathiel the Bosma who refuses to use a bow. You experience choice in a different way. Rather than follow a train track that diverges into many different train tracks that then again diverge further, you're instead thrown onto a turntable, and you can choose to go in any direction you like. Of course, I'm very well aware that if both of these systems were implemented, you'd have a better game, but still. Anyways, let's get back to the discussion at hand, which is about why The Elder Scrolls is the greatest fictional universe to me. And I think there is no better place to start than the unreliable narrator. In many fictional universes, games, books, movies, etc., information is typically delivered in certainty, meaning that the narrator or the writer, the director, essentially whoever is leading the story is considered to be a truth teller. They are telling the story. They possess an omniscient understanding of the world, so you may trust what they say as fact. In the Elder Scrolls, there is no glossary, no encyclopedia of facts, no codex, no omniscient understanding of all things. The narrator in this game, the book authors, the game designers and so on, tell stories from perspective. And what do we know about perspective? It's a view of things as seen through the eyes of an individual, meaning it is subjective and contextual to their previous experiences their bias, their understanding of the world. This is what it means to have an unreliable narrator. The books you read when you adventure the game worlds of the Elder Scrolls are told from the perspective of in-universe characters, characters with different origins, wildly different beliefs, values, and all manner of defining features that could potentially compromise their ability to truly deliver an objective truth of the matter. Of course, you can experience what you do in the games and what you see, but even that can be received differently depending on how you interpret the information. In the Wisp Mothers, you may just see an angry ghost, but to another, it may look like the forlorn soul of a snow elf bound to this world by curse or unfinished business. Even if you look for it, there is no definitive answer. The gorgeous beauty of this type of storytelling to me is that it creates immense mystery and deepens every aspect of the world. And to take that further, I'd even argue that the unreliable narrator allows the player to exercise exercise critical thinking and make a self-informed decision about what they are experiencing, rather than having informational, indisputable truth blasted into their mind's eye. The unreliable narrator creates a more tantalizing experience because even the simplest exposition of info dump must be held under a scrutinous eye. It furthers the mystery, it deepens the world, there is always more to discover. I think it'd be helpful if we looked at some examples. In the most recent entry of the mainline Elder Scrolls series, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, the premise of the Civil War is that Ulfric Stormcloak killed the High King and is trying to defeat the Empire. So using deduction, we can assume that High King Torig is dead. Everyone agrees on that, and we can see him in Sovngarde. Ulfric claims he killed him, everyone else claimed Ulfric killed him, we can all agree that Ulfric killed the king. But the mystery is in the details. Why and how did Ulfric kill him? Imperials and Empire supporters tend to say that Ulfric rode up into the Blue Palace and used his mighty thumb to shout the High King into many pieces. Others say he shouted Torig to the ground and stuck him with his sword. Either way, these actions would classify as unjust, as murder. Whereas among Ulfric, the Stormcloaks and various individuals such as Rogvir, the man who opened the gate for his escape, 
claim that Ulfric lawfully challenged Torrig to a duel, as is ancient custom of Skyrim. The beauty of this is that there is no 100% confirmed answer. We can use deduction and perhaps come up with more likely scenarios. Some people may have had better first-hand accounts, but then again, even if there was a legal duel, they don't want to further support Ulfric's claim, so why would they tell the truth? The idea of a traditional Nordic battle for the throne versus that of murder makes the Civil War and Ulfric a far more compelling conflict and character. Why? Because we don't know the truth. We can't be certain. I can play a character who believes in Ulfric as a just and honourable hero, or I can play a character who believes him to be an egomaniacal murderer. Via the unreliable narrator, both points of view are valid without the presence of concrete omniscient evidence. But let's go back a little further to Morrowind, the game that really doubled down on this idea of an unreliable narrator. The infamous Battle of Red Mountain has many different tales about how it went down and ultimately there is no definitive answer. What's even more interesting is that from a design perspective, people who worked on Morrowind actually said that there was no in-house agreed upon canon series of events. It is left entirely to the viewer, reader or player to use their critical thinking and come to their own conclusions. There is a version where the tribunal ascend and gain divinity by just being so amazing. There's a version where they claimed godly power from the heart of Lorcan despite Azura's warnings. There's a version where Nerevar fell in battle and another where the tribunal committed foul murder and ritualistically killed their general. There is a version where Dagoth went to the Nords and told them where to find Find their dead god's heart, where they did battle against Nerevar. There is a version where a Sench Khajiit is used as a battle mount. There are many conflicting accounts and retellings of this legendary event that happened thousands of years ago. Maybe they are all wrong, maybe they're all right, and when we get into some of the metaphysical bits and pieces of the universe later, we can talk about how these contradictory events could all be true in a more literal sense. But before that, I really want to finish off with some closing remarks about the unreliable narrator. The push for the unreliable narrator is the push for myth. The Elder Scrolls is very aware of the myth versus the mundane. When you explain information in an omniscient codex of fact, it may be cool, but it becomes mundane. You no longer think about it. It is what it is. It's explained with a fact. Whereas in the Battle of Red Mountain, for example, you have multiple cultures and people all explaining their personal subjective truth. And I say truth because they believe it to be the truth. And this all falls within the realm of myth. This grand event has a mythology formed around it, but that is what makes it exciting. Fantasy as a whole is a genre that usually returns to pre-enlightenment age mentality of where this mythology is literal truth to them. So the Elder Scrolls leaning more heavily on the mythic, the undiscovered, the unreliable in quote, truths of individuals or cultures creates a more compelling and awe-inspiring world rather than having an event described with omniscient certainty. A good analogy for this myth versus mundane dynamic is a simple magic trick. A magic pulls a white dove from his sleeve and makes it disappear into his hat just as quickly. This is magic. It's awe-inspiring. You don't understand how he did it. It's what makes it interesting. It's tantalizing. It really is magic. If not, how the hell did he do it? Was it like this or was it like that? It's a mythical mystery. You can have your thoughts about it, but you don't know for sure. However, what happens when you find out? What happens when you know how the trick is done? The amazement is gone. Maybe you have some respect for the talented sleight of hand, but you no longer swell with wonder and awe. The magic trick has left the realm of myth and become mundane. It's the same reason that many long for their childhood, for the nostalgia. It was a time when the world was less understood, but now you have transitioned into a world of understanding where everything becomes mundane and explained. There is no mystery over the hill. It's a shopping center with a McDonald's. So long story short, via the unreliable narrator, the Elder Scrolls universe heavily leans on concepts of mythology as opposed to mundane. It chooses to view facts of the world through the limited understanding of the people within it, which ultimately creates a universe that once again sparks that childlike imagination and sense of adventure and discovery that is lost in the mundane real world. I think that is why the Elder Scrolls lore is debated and discussed in forums for the many arduous years in between releases. It's why channels like ours that deliver hundreds of lore videos, discussions and discoveries are largely about a series whose last main 
mainline entry was nearly a decade ago. But let's now dig a little deeper and discuss some of the greater themes and also one of my favourite fictional settings that was cited as an inspiration for the world building of the Elder Scrolls. In a Reddit AMA, Michael Kirkbride, one of the many minds behind Morrowind's success, cited the tabletop RPG Glorantha as an inspiration for Morrowind's world building. People could point to similar ancient vibes of the Dunma and Dwemer, and their partial inspirations found in ancient Mesopotamia, and I'm sure these influenced parts of their architecture and clothing. Similar to that, Glorantha has an ancient pseudo Bronze Age type setting, aesthetic trappings can be easily plastered on, but what I'm talking about here is the core metaphysical philosophies of the Elder Scrolls that find their inspiration in Glorantha. Listen to this little blurb about Glorantha and see if it sounds familiar. Come explore Glorantha, a Bronze Age world where mythology comes to life and adventure is only a step away. Glorantha is in many ways similar to our own world, but exists in a magical universe where the laws of physics are subordinate to the whims of gods and spirits. To understand Glorantha, you must leave our mundane world and enter the world of myth. The sun is a living god and not a nearby star. Countless gods exist, some even more powerful than the sun, and all have the power to directly affect humanity. Rulers and leaders use magical rather than technological means to achieve their ends, and even the humblest of persons will cross the paths of the gods and spirits. Now let's try that on with the Elder Scrolls. Come explore Mundus, a late medieval world where mythology comes to life and adventure is only a step away. Mundus in many ways is similar to our own world, but exists in a magical universe where the laws of physics are subordinate to the whims of the gods and spirits. To understand Mundus, you must leave our mundane world and enter the world of myth. The sun is a hole in the sky torn at creation and not a nearby star. Countless gods exist, some even more powerful than Magnus, and all have the power to directly affect the races of Nern. Rulers and leaders use magical rather than technological means to achieve their ends, and even the humblest of persons will cross the paths of the gods and spirits. Because of the mythological nature of the Elder Scrolls and the way the gods are understood as entities interpreted by various different cultures, it's near impossible to discern any true fact based upon empirical evidence. Is the Red Guard mythology correct? Well, you can go to the Far Shores, their afterlife, so maybe they're right, but wait, maybe the Nords are correct, because you can physically go to Sovngarde too. If both those places exist, is Shaw real, or is it Sep? Which of their creation stories is correct? This is the kind of mental anguish that can go through the mind of modern man when trying to understand the contradictory nature of mythology and psychology. Listen to this quote by Greg Stafford, the creator of Glorantha and founder of Chaosium. Fantasy is not so much a suspension of disbelief as it is an acceptance of our own unconsciousness. Fantasy is as old as man, beginning back in our animal history when someone had the first abstract thought. In our Western society, empirical data and rational thought have become the touchstones of experience. This is worse than cutting off half your body. The fantastic is easily half of the universe, whether you count galaxies and nucleotides or caught a demon in a pentacle. I really love this quote and I think it rings true with the success of fantasy and escapism as a whole in the modern world. It's just that in our civilization, mythical elements have been mostly divorced from reality and compartmentalized into fact and fiction. Whereas both in Glorantha and the world of the Elder Scrolls, the lines are blurred. Myth makes reality. When certain gods gain power through worship and praise, in turn their influence affects the very course of the world. An easy example is within the antagonist Thalmor, who outlawed the worship of Talos because they do not want this god of empire and men to flourish. They want his influence on the world to cease. If mythology is reality in the Elder Scrolls, then it could be said to control the mythology is to control reality. It does not matter if Talos truly does exist. If you can kill the idea of him, well then he no longer exists. Hence the Thalmor's goal. Elder Scrolls mythology, or rather theology, is vast and complicated, and it's largely based on various cultural interpretations. Even the basic Anu, Padme, Lorcan, or Eol creation story 
is one of elven design. It is one of many versions of creation. Through comparative religion, we can analyze the similarities and find the essence of ideas and philosophical themes that are common in all different Tamrielic cultures in an attempt to find the factual truth. But ultimately, you are left with many different interpretations, or as the cultures themselves would say, truths. This is not unlike our own real world, and I think it's part of the reason that the Elder Scrolls, despite being such a fantastical place, feels so tangible and authentic. One final little thing I'd like to touch on is changing your perception of truth. Because if you can see it like this, you may be able to enjoy the stranger facets of Elder Scrolls lore much more. Here's an analogy. Imagine a god as an idea or a concept, a theme. Imagine that idea as light. That light is shot into a crystal and from it, it's split into all these different colors. Each one of those colors represents what each culture sees. It's their truth. They are perceiving it as this color because of how the crystal refracts the light. The crystal could be said to be representative of sensory limitations. It's what defines the subjective element. However, remember, there is a core source of light, an underlying truth. So in a way, there technically is a truth to all of the religions. There is a singular source of light, the singular idea that has been perceived and understood in various ways. Also, when you start dabbling in the bending of time and space and retrospect, perspective changes, then it gets all the crazier. Then understand that gods experience time differently and somewhat exist outside of time. Then because time is not a limitation they experience, if they grow in influence at one point, the out of time entity grows in power, able to influence any point in time. But yeah, a really great video we made for understanding this concept is the Vivek Explained video, which goes into lots of this type of discussion. Also, the complete guide to gods may be very useful, but this is already a very long video, so I won't go too much into that. Ultimately, the point here is that the various interpretations of various cultures are not lies as opposed to a truth. They are subjective truths, limited by sensory or circumstantial limitations. It would probably be fair to guess that the actual truth is unknowable. Maybe if you saw the light from the source, you'd be struck blind like the moth priests who read the Elder Scrolls. The Elder Scrolls is a highly interpretive universe, and there are some beautiful understandings of it contained within the lore and world itself. But also, the Elder Scrolls has used actual narrative devices, whether poorly written copes or not, to determine the in-universe events. In some ways, these may feel cheap, but in other ways, they actually deepen the universe and make it free flowing and growing instead of being confined by a singular authority. This has its ups and downs and people are entitled to their own view of things. But let's explain some of the ways that the Elder Scrolls has implemented some in-universe retcons. Let's start with the infamous Dragon Break. As far as I'm aware, the Dragon Break was invented by the time of the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. If we go way back to the 90s, Elder Scrolls' first entry titled Arena was then followed by Daggerfall. In tone and feel, as well as gameplay goals, the games were very different from the Elder Scrolls we know today. If you look at the art styles and the foundational lore of that time, the Elder Scrolls is more akin to a typical D&D type setting, but of course there are still many of the things that we know and love, such as the Daedric Princes, but overall the vibe are more of that Pulp Fiction, Frank Fazetta, Clyde Caldwell type aesthetic with classical fantasy archetypes. Another interesting note that I want to drop here is that the Elder Scrolls II Daggerfall in particular had a lot of input from fans of Arena in forums and a lot of the lore and even names of certain gods are just anagrams of usernames. This was back in the day when internet forums were more of a secret club. Anyways, that is more important to remember because it's coming up again later. So back to Daggerfall. At the end of Elder Scrolls 2, there are many different endings, all of which are incredibly diverse, such as the one where all of the Bay Kings are destroyed by the Orc leader Gortwog, or one where the Lich Man Marco uses the Mantella to become a god. Now when we have Bethesda come back to the mainline Elder Scrolls series, they wanted to devise a way to avoid invalidating the personal decisions of players in the previous games, and at the same time, the universe was undergoing a sort of tone reimagining entirely, which was initiated with the creation of the Elder Scrolls Scrolls Adventures Redguard. So the Dragon Break was invented. To explain this in the simplest terms for in-law purposes, a Dragon Break occurs during a massive metaphysical event that breaks the timeline. The typical depiction of the Time God in the Elder Scrolls is Akatosh, a dragon. So when the Dragon Breaks, 
time breaks. So during such an event, the timelines diverge into multiple different versions, such as the multiple endings of Daggerfall. But at the end of the Dragon Break, the timeline corrects itself and stitches those timelines into a singular one once again. However, the problem here is that there are multiple contradictory and equally true events that have now played out, which now affect the canon. Ultimately, the Miracle of Peace, or Warp in the West as it is otherwise called, is the canon outcome for the events of Daggerfall 2. So with the invention of the Dragon Break, they tidied the ending of Daggerfall up, no harm, no foul, now we enter a fresh slate with Morrowind, which did something drastically different. Morrowind primarily through the living god Vivek introduces some really interesting ideas. We first hear of concepts like Kim, which is predicated on the idea that everything within the Elder Scrolls universe is contained within an unknowable entity which we can refer to as the Godhead. The idea is that it's all a dream. When you achieve a state of enlightenment known as Kim, you come to the realization that you are not real per se, but rather an imagined being in a dream. However, at the same time, you manage to maintain a sense of ego and individuality, which then gives you a state akin to that of a lucid dreamer. You are able to control the dream. Now at face value interpretation, you may be like, that sucks, I don't want it to be a dream. But if you get really meta about it, it quite literally is. Sure, there is a real physical game with characters in it, but you're experience of the universe is simulated. It's a game, it's not reality, like a dream. Funnily enough, Vivek mentions such enlightenment as seeing the wheel, which is the universe, on its side, which spells I. This has its in-universe explanations and meaning. However, some have interpreted this as Vivek's knowledge that he is an NPC, a video game character, a breaking of the fourth wall. When he sees the wheel on its side and achieves Kim in game, he is actually seeing the CD-ROM that Morrowind was shipped on on its side. The universe is a wheel, like a CD-ROM. Now, that is one interpretation that can also be seen differently, as all contained within the universe, but this meta aspect of the Elder Scrolls universe is something that I find very interesting. Kim has also been used as a device to change the timeline to suit game design preferences. As we talked about with Cyrodiil, it was once described as a jungle, but upon Oblivion's release, it was a European countryside. Tiber Septum has been said to achieve Kim and change changed Cyrodiil from jungle to grasslands, as quoted by Heimskir. Let me show you the power of Talos Stormcrown, born of the north, where my breath is long winter. I breathe now in royalty and reshape this land which is mine. I do this for you, Red Legions, for I love you! What is even more interesting about this is that it's a direct reference to a piece written by Michael Kirkbride who was no longer working for Bethesda at the time. This is important for later discussions about canon, like the Daggerfall forums thing I mentioned earlier, but this piece was from the many-headed Talos, which says, You have suffered for me to win this throne, and I see how you hate jungle. Let me show you the power of Talos Stormcrown, born of the north, where my breath is long winter. I breathe now in royalty, and reshape this land which is mine. I do this for you, Red Legions, for I love you. Beyond this implementation, the series ran into more trouble by the time of Elder Scrolls Online because now before the time of Tiber Septum, Cyrodiil is still depicted as fertile countryside. There are extra explanations, such as the infamously terrible transcription error explanation. There is the idea that Talos's actions changed the timeline retroactively. And then there's also ideas about the current ruler of the White Gold Tower changing the landscape. And whatever your opinions on the efficacy of each explanation, regardless, they are all a possibility thanks to the self-correcting nature of the unreliable narrator, as well as concepts like Kim and Dragon Breaks. Now, whatever your opinion on these devices from a qualitative perspective, you have to credit Bethesda with the actual desire to incorporate many versions of Tamriel and history without completely invalidating your prior experiences in the series and additionally invalidating your interpretations. This is what, to me, makes The Elder Scrolls such a beautiful and persistent piece of fiction. 
I can still latch onto the ideas and perspectives that I enjoy from the Elder Scrolls, while someone else may latch onto different perspectives and ideas, but what happens is that we both enjoy the Elder Scrolls. A terrible example of a company decision in regards to canon is what Disney did to Star Wars. Upon the plans for the new sequel trilogy, Disney officially invalidated all of the expanded universe that had been building for decades prior. Beloved games like the Knights of the Old Republic or the Jedi Knight series, comic series about the great hyperspace war, the Rakata, book series such as the sequels of Luke beginning a new Jedi Academy on Yavin, his marriage, yada yada and so on. There was so much awesome Star Wars lore that was then relegated to this Legends tag, which means non-canon in Disney's eyes. I think if Bethesda ever went ahead and did something like this, they would murder their franchise. But luckily, fundamentally, The Elder Scrolls has been a series largely based on the unreliable narrator, which helps the series persist with this focus on player experience and interpretation rather than canon lore dictation. Of course, there will be moments where some things are unavoidable and the better evidence presented in-game will point to a new theory, but for the most part, I think Bethesda stays true to an interpretation-based universe, even when they do make moves in a direction they prefer. An easy example is the lack or small mention of the Nordic pantheon in Skyrim. Nords of the Fourth Era are largely imperialized, and personally I think this makes them more boring, but this can be rationalized by a systematic imperialization and change of culture in the 200 years since Oblivion. So both the Nordic pantheon and the imperialized Nords are valid, but if Bethesda had just sort of explicitly gone and said, nope, they never worshipped Shaw and so on, you could see how that would be a hundred times worse. To finish off this section, ultimately because of all of the narrative devices such as the unreliable narrator, author bias, dragon breaks, Kim, and so on, we are left with a fictional universe that is fluid, can be interpreted, and ultimately change and keep fresh throughout the years without invalidating old fans or intimidating new ones. Retcons of the current timeline here aren't just company decisions, they're incorporated into the very fabric of the fictional universe. And I think this is done for the fans. Now we're at the time to talk about the infamous Michael Kirkbride coda and the everlasting canon wars between fans who deny interpretation and those who extend interpretation as far as saying known as made of cheese. Let's crack open this can of beans and have a discussion. Michael Kirkbride, as I've mentioned, worked at Bethesda and specifically worked with the team that laid the foundations of world building for Morrowind. Of course, he actually worked on the game itself too, but he was heavily involved in the creative process. He has since left Bethesda, but did some contract work for the Knights of the Nine DLC in Oblivion. Specifically, he is probably most renowned for writing the 36 Lessons of Vivek. Outside of an official capacity, he has written many texts with the aim of deepening the Elder Scrolls world, things such as Shaw Son of Shaw or the Seven Fights of the Aldudaga. Many fans have taken a liking to his external writings on the Elder Scrolls despite there being no in-game appearance of these texts. Now, Michael Kirkbride also wrote a script for a graphic novel called Coda. You may have heard this name thrown around a fair bit in Reddit threads and comment sections, and it's a touchy topic for some lawbeards. Coda is set in the fifth era on the moon Massa. In the shortest summary possible, the Nemidium goes nuts, destroys Nern, and the Dunma flee and make their new home on the moon. It's a science fantasy evolution of Morrowind. Now, from what I understand, Michael Kirkbride, at least partially, wrote this as a conclusion to the metaphysical story of the Elder Scrolls III. Morrowind. As we discussed, Bethesda with Oblivion began to take the Elder Scrolls in a different route, a little more focus on traditional fantasy as opposed to the more mind-boggling, nuanced, philosophical story of false gods, multiple truths, and betrayal. And don't get me wrong, I love both. I think it just ultimately comes down to the fact that the former is far more common in fantasy circles than the latter. So, Coda is basically a conclusion to the Morrowind meta-story, if that makes sense. It's what Kirkbride wrote to finish that tale 
his way. In music, a coda is a section that concludes an entire piece or a major movement. In this example, we're talking about the game Morrowind, and it generally presents new musical themes or changes the key to create an audible difference as a way to resolve musical tension and complete the composition. So this audible difference, in Kirkbride's case, would be the science fantasy setting of the moon, set in the far future fifth era that differs substantially from Morrowind's setting, but nonetheless concludes the story told throughout. I would also like to add that Kirkbride's coda is actually alluded to in the 37th Sermon of Avec that appeared in the Elder Scrolls Online Morrowind DLC, which is kind of cool and perhaps validates it a bit more, but more than likely it's just a nod. Now, the significance of this piece of writing is not that it's crazy or that it's even written by a former Bethesda employee, because as I understand, Kirkbride would not like the idea of authoritative credentials such as this. Part of the underlying idea that was additionally being pushed by his work coda is this concept of open source law. It challenges the importance of corporate defined canon. Of course, in a legal capacity, canon is whatever Bethesda says it is. They can evolve their brand, franchise, whatever you want to call it, how they want. Intellectual property and all that, and it's well within their rights. But on a more philosophical, artistic concerned level, The Elder Scrolls has always been and still is a two-way street in regards to law. Because of its incessant focus on player viewer interpretation, a lot of Daggerfall's lore itself was built by forum members and the community itself, establishing this precedent of community involvement in the creative construction of the universe. The establishment of dragon breaks and other metaphysical gymnastics and convenient copes have all been largely performed to retain a sense of continuity in the series despite direction changes. Reliance on the unreliable narrator and things like dragon breaks have been staple Bethesda ideals out of respect for the player's experiences and deciding not to invalidate the choices players made in previous games. And to me, this is all incredibly commendable in my opinion. It's part of what makes The Elder Scrolls so great to me. But the reason I brought those additional points up is that the precedent for a sort of open source community interpretation type of law is embedded in the series fundamentally. So let's get to that. What is open source law? Well, open source in computer terms is the definition of source code that is made freely available and allowed to be redistributed and modified. So if we were to relate this to open source law, we would be talking about the idea that this information, the core law established in the games, is allowed to be redistributed and modified. Now, look, there is all kinds of legal trouble here. You're not allowed to profit off things using their intellectual property. All that legal stuff gets sticky. But what Kirkbride is making the push for, from my understanding, is the idea that people's interpretations, or in fact, expansions on the universe, are valid and allowed. Rather than having a strict policing of what is canon law according to corporate mandate, the idea is to rather dissolve the idea of canon. You may think this is absurd, crazy, but let's look at some examples. What's an orc to you? What is a canon orc? Big, green, angry, violent, ugly, a corrupted elf perhaps? Well, orcs as we know them today are basically just jacked from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. After its success, it had many replications and you could argue that many of Tolkien's races set the typical archetypes for the fantasy genre. D&D, Warcraft, Elder Scrolls, they all have orcs and orcs have certain core features. They may have their twists and subversions, but they require certain key commonly understood features to be orcs. This would also apply to elves, pointy ears, beautiful, long-lived. But we don't invalidate orcs or elves in the Elder Scrolls, for example, because Tolkien's elves and orcs are the canon ones. Or maybe you think Warcraft versions should be canon. At the end of the day, silliness aside, an orc or an elf is an idea brought into the mainstream by Tolkien, established as a fantasy staple, and each new fictional creation reinterprets the piece. So for example, the same could be done with the Elder Scrolls. You just need to maintain the core ideas and identifiable themes or characters. I guess another good example would be to look at the works of Shakespeare. How many versions of Hamlet are there? How many different gender-bending, genre-bending, setting-bending versions of Romeo and Juliet are there? The answer is many, but they aren't cast down as invalid and not canon. 
canon isn't a concern. Shakespeare is like open source fiction. The support for this kind of idea can even be found in the very origins of Elder Scrolls itself. Remember the setting for the Elder Scrolls was once a Dungeons and Dragons game between Bethesda employees. It is inherently a transformative and derivative piece of fiction. Hence why people view it as hypocritical to then clamp down on ideas of canon. Not that Bethesda actually do this. Like I said, most of the time Bethesda build their games in a supportive way for interpretation and personalization for the player. You could even extend this company philosophy to their great support of the modding community. An amazing example of modding, by the way, is the Tamriel Rebuilt project. You see, initially the Elder Scrolls 3's development scope was cut back from all of Morrowind to just the island of Vardenfell. But a modding team since those early days has endeavoured to finish creating all of Morrowind in the engine. This also spawned other projects such as Cyrodiil and Skyrim Home of the Nords. A lot of the lore is built by this team and is interpreted as they envisioned the rest of Tamriel to be from the view of that era's incarnation. In the late 90s, early 2000s, Tamriel was as it is described in the Pocket Guide to the Empire and by the NPCs and the in-game books of Morrowind. The jungle Cyrodiil, the badass metal Nords, the Reachman natives who weren't just cavemen, these projects are still ongoing today and they desire to bring the alien interpretations of Morrowind era to fruition. And yes, in legal jargon they are not canon, but to me at least they are valid and ought to be appreciated interpretations of the Elder Scrolls. Once again, using in law canon tools such as the concepts of Kalpers, people have tried to explain the different interpretations of lore. So for example, a Morrowind Tamriel rebuilt coder type Kalper and then an Oblivion Kalper, an ESO Kalper, etc. I think it's kind of funny, but I get what it's trying to do. And to be fair, every single Elder Scrolls entry has differed somewhat from the others, at least in terms of artistic design, but on a deeper level, gameplay mechanics, philosophical themes, and story types. Morrowind is a dialogue-heavy exploration of philosophies and a medieval alien Star Wars-like world. Oblivion is a more Lord of the Rings feeling, whimsical and awe-inspiring on the surface, which hides the darkness beneath and the creeping anxiety of impending demon doom. Skyrim is a grittier, hardier take on the franchise, a power fan where you're the dragonborn, here to take down Alduin. It really channels the vicious Conan the Barbarian power fantasy vibes. I love all of these games, and each of them interprets the Elder Scrolls in a different way, while also advancing the series along its trajectory. Honestly, it's just my favourite piece of fiction of all time. For all the reasons I've said, it just makes the universe feel so organic and living. It's alive! And I want to continue living through new interpretations, whether that be Elder Scrolls 6, the Beyond Skyrim project, or rather, just someone's fan animation such as the wonderful work by All in All. The Elder Scrolls universe is just the greatest. Well, to me at least, and I'm sure many of you would agree. It is this living, breathing world of endless, evolving lore interpreted and speculated upon, constantly adapting. It's in the Elder Scrolls that Pelennor Whitestrake can both be interpreted as a Shezzerine, Spirit Crusader, Slayer of Elves, or rather a gay Terminator from the future who with his uncle Winged Bull slays hordes of Aelids like Doomguy. Both are valid interpretations. Admittedly, one is spacier, but that's the fun of the Elder Scrolls. It can appeal to those who love more traditional fantasy worlds, while also appealing to those who love the zania out there takes. And it just so happens that I love both. So for me, the Elder Scrolls universe is quite simply the greatest fictional universe. I mean, it should have come across by now that this is a subjective opinion piece, but hopefully a little bit of my Elder Scrolls love has rubbed off on you. And if you already loved the Elder Scrolls for the same reasons I do, well, you've enjoyed an hour of confirmation and fun talking points. Maybe I helped you understand why you enjoy it. Let me know if I did in the comments below. I would implore you to like the video, and if you love the Elder Scrolls, and if you love this video, please do consider subscribing to the channel, for we create many Elder Scrolls lore videos, and we run a podcast mostly dedicated to discussing Elder Scrolls lore, but also the Elder Scrolls games more broadly from time to time. The Elder Scrolls has given me thousands of hours of fun, and it's encouraged me to expand my imagination, explore new and uncomfortable ideas. It has allowed me to play out the lives of characters that take actions I never would. Through the Elder Scrolls, I have seen new perspectives, met friends, built a community, a way to support my family. It's given me a mythology, an escape from the mundane experiences of the day-to-day -day life. It's something fantastical, something magical residing in the minds of many. My name is Scott from Fudge Muppet, and as always, I'll be back to nerd 
nerd out with you again very soon and also for the many great years to come. Thanks for watching.